In this video, I'll teach you how to make a version of my favorite cane, what has become known as the Paradox Cane. So why do we call it a Paradox Cane anyways? From what I can tell, the name appears to be derived from a Zen Tangle Doodle they call the Paradox, because you're imitating a curved line with just straight lines. This in turn is based on a much older technique you may have seen called curve stitching, and is often found in childhood crafts and adult string art. The first translation to clay that I'm familiar with was by Lindsay Hansen, who works under the name Vivid Clay. A few months after I made and enjoyed Lindsay's cane, I got Meg Newberg's December Cane Builder Edition, where she created a new way to make a similar cane. Lindsay's version borrows heavily from the curve stitching construction style. She creates straight cuts through a triangle that she curves only slightly around the center. Meg's isn't actually a curve stitch construction method, but it creates a similar visual pattern and is more space filling. It's also a triangle, and I really enjoy patterns based on triangles. I have made many Paradox canes and evolved my own variation on making them, but it is heavily based on Meg, so I did check with her before making my own tutorial. I recommend buying her tutorial as she has some wonderful color recipes and her take on the construction techniques for it. This video will cover one of my variations that I call the Spliced Paradox Cane, because it combines spliced canes and Paradox canes into a single organically geometric cane. There are a few critical steps that I think are make or break when making this cane. I will highlight them as we go and review them at the end. I'm using my violet and sea green Kato hues, but you can use any two colors for this. I have the color recipes listed in the video description below. Both my Skinner blends have these approximate shapes of clay to make the blend. Blend about 20 times and then turn both into jelly rolls. If you aren't sure how to make a jelly roll cane, I've included a link down below or you can search Google or YouTube. Next, you need to slice your jelly rolls. You don't need to be perfect here, but you do want your cuts to be the same top to bottom to minimize variation along the length of the cane. I flatten my jelly roll slightly and then use the back of my blade to make an indentation that will be the guide for my cuts. Choose one of your colors and cut one of the quarters into two pieces. Whichever color you pick to do this will be the one that looks more like the foreground, and the other will look more like it's the background. Here's an example of a different pair of colors arranged in both ways to make very different looking canes. The one on the left has the orange as the foreground, and the one on the right has the blue as the foreground. At this point, your jelly roll cane should look like this. Four quarter circles of your background color, and five of your foreground color. Three of those foreground colors are quarter circles, and the final two are eighth circles. Next, you need to modify your slices by pulling the sides of each slice up. Note that I'm not just squishing them, I'm actually pulling the sides towards the tip to bring those darker parts of the blend up to where the lighter parts of the blend are. Periodically, you'll need to reshape your cane to be flat on both ends to keep from losing clay or distorting your cane too much. You don't need to pull your sides up the exact amount I do. If you do less, the blend will look smoother. If you do more, the contrast in the middle of the cane will be even stronger. I handle the smaller pieces differently. The idea of the smaller pieces is that when they join in the middle, they'll create two halves of another peak of color. So rather than bringing both sides up, I only bring up the dark outside on one side, and as I'm shaping it, I'm repeatedly comparing it to a finished quarter piece to try to imitate what half of that quarter looks like in both color and shape. Reshape all of your cane pieces, and at the end, make sure all of them are the same height. Now you'll create the main cane body by arranging all those cane pieces. Alternate colors and put the two smaller pieces on the outsides with their flat, fully blended side outwards. If you don't get the orientation correct for these two smaller pieces, your final cane will look very odd when joined with itself. You can overlap the colors more if you like, that will bring more white up to the ends of the cane. Or you can overlap them less, which will concentrate the white more in the very middle of the final cane. Next, we're going to reduce this cane in preparation for turning it into a triangle and eventually assembling the final cane. I'm taking care of the ends so I don't lose the top of my two smaller canes. I'm also making sure that all those cane quarters merge as much as possible into a single piece of clay. If your cane quarters aren't well joined, you will find the next step very difficult because they will separate while you're trying to reshape the cane. Next, you need to turn this into a triangle. The point of the triangle will be the color that has the two smaller end pieces. As I mentioned before, there's some critical steps in making this cane, and our first one is right here. It's important that you reduce it by squeezing in the middle rather than at the ends. You want all the clay to move together, not to just have the top and bottom curve towards each other. I take my time on this step, trying to keep all the clay together. I repeatedly flatten the top and bottom against my work surface and pull the edges out, keeping sharp corners everywhere. This is to minimize how much clay we lose in the step, since there's still a lot of work we need to do to get this to our final cane. 
I noticed some of my white had crept too much towards the end here, so I just trimmed it back. I don't want any white on either end of the cane. Eventually, you can't avoid some folding of the top and bottom together, but you want it to happen as late in the reduction process as possible. That's why you do almost all of your squeezing in the middle instead of the ends until you're almost done. The second critical step for this cane is making sure that the long backside is well joined, forming as flat a surface as possible. If you don't, and I speak from experience here, they will come apart later when we're shaping the cane. Take your time and get all the corners really sharp. You'll need to keep sharpening them in the next step, but it's good to begin that process here. Now we're going to form the interim shape of this cane. You need to lengthen and curve one side of the long cane into a J shape. The third critical step is getting this shape right. You need a J shape, not an L shape, and you want the bottom of your cane to be long and thin and even. As before, you want to push into the cane from the side, not just squeeze the ends, so you do want to make sure you keep your cane points sharp. At the same time, I'm working on the bottom and further stretching and thinning it out. This always takes more squeezing and shaping than I expect it will, it's important to fully and properly distort this end of the cane and to try to bring along more than just the surface clay when you do so. The fourth critical step is keeping your edges sharp. If you don't, these nice lines will become bumpy and misshapen in the final cane as the rest of the clay moves around it to close gaps. If you'd like to watch a video of the entire process of reducing and reforming this cane, there's a video on my YouTube channel, Motley Clay, in a playlist called Raw that shows the uncut footage. I've also linked in the video description below. Once you have your clay somewhat close to the final shape, cut off the distorted ends and turn the remaining cane into three equal pieces. The equal pieces part is actually important for this part of the cane. If you're finding your Paradox canes are distorting too much, it's likely because your three pieces aren't the same length. So when you try to reduce the cane, you're pushing that extra clay into the rest of the clay and it makes the pattern offset too much. This is the fifth and final critical step, getting the arrangement of your three pieces correct. It does take some nudging and pulling and massaging, so take your time. I arrange the first two pieces to see if the ends are long enough, and they never are. So first I'm going to lengthen those points at the end. If you don't bring them all the way to the bottom of the other piece, then you don't get as nice an interleaved pattern in the final cane. I lengthen all the bottoms of all the pieces to match the one that I lengthened first. When you're reshaping these pieces, try to be consistent. Don't just reshape the top and the bottom and call it good. Try to avoid bumps and inconsistencies as best you can along the whole length of the cane piece. I'm going to show all of this footage uncut because it's such a critical part of the process. The tops also need to be long enough and thin enough to gracefully curve around. Try to keep the thickness consistent everywhere. Once you're comfortable with your first two pieces, join them together and move on to the third. And the third piece is always a bit of a bear to get in place. I think this was probably one of my worst attempts, but it's what I have on film, so it's what I'll use. I tried to get the interior spiraling a bit more than I have in other canes, but I think it just resulted in that one piece forming a little curly cue in the middle. I've also found that I always end up with the center slightly off-center, possibly because of how I'm putting the cane together. If I figure out a way to avoid that, I will post it in a new video show just part of the reduction here. If you'd like to watch a video of the entire process of reducing this cane, there's a video on my YouTube channel, Motley Clay, in a playlist called Raw that shows the uncut footage. I've also linked it in the video description below. You'll notice that I'm reducing by squeezing the middle just like we did before when reshaping the cane. This is to try to get the middle moving and not just the edges. And just like before, you will want to periodically push those two ends back into the main cane body. This minimizes lost and distorted clay at this early point in the cane reduction process. You want your corners to be very sharp. Skipping ahead a bit here, once you get your cane longer, you want to reduce your triangle by squeezing along the bottom, not along the top point. This helps the bulk of the clay move and keeps the triangle from distorting as you go. This bottom squeezing is what I do to reduce the entire rest of the cane, all the way down to the tiny sizes I use to make pens. Before I go, I also want to show you how easy it is to turn this into a square if you prefer that shape. 
Take a section of your cane and cut it in half. My cut wasn't perfect, so I trimmed down the pieces a bit to have closer to the same amount of clay on each half to help reduce distortion in the final cane. Then join the two halves together as mirror images, being careful to join along the whole cane length, not just matching up the two ends and hoping the middle works out. Then slowly change your diamond shape into a square by pushing on the ends and reshaping it. Make sure you get your corners sharp in this process. You can also conjoin them as not mirror images and get a completely different look if you want, with the center pointing in two directions rather than the same direction like this, looking like an arrow, but I don't have enough clay to demonstrate both. Here's an image of a cane that works that way, although this one's a triangle, the same principle would work with a square. As a final reminder, here are those five critical steps I said I'd review that you need to make sure you follow while putting this cane together. This is really a beautiful cane to make, but it definitely takes practice. Don't give up too quickly if your first attempt isn't what you hoped it would be. There are so many variations you can do with this basic construction technique. Obviously, you can change up the colors, but you can also vary how the blends are done, how many different colors you use and where, whether you separate them with black or not, whether you use mirrors, whether you use rotations, and so on. I really enjoy this cane, and I hope if you enjoyed it, you come up with some great variations. I would love to see what you do. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them quickly. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this.